And if they don't like it happening right beside the building, then they say, well, we're evicting you. Tonight, who's the landlord here? Evicted protest camps at the Manitoba Legislature get a three-day reprieve. It's pretty significant to my nation as it's uh, a sizable chunk of our land. A huge piece of land is given back to a BC First Nation. Women are at great risk of further violence from an abusive ex when they make the crucial and life-changing decision to leave and seek safety. And single mothers say they need more help from legal aid to escape abusive partners. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. A Saskatoon woman is facing charges in the United States and Canada. She's expected to be back on Canadian soil by the end of the day. Don Walker has spent the past two weeks in federal custody in Oregon, where she was arrested for allegedly using false identification to cross the border with her seven-year-old son. According to the Canadian press, a U.S. judge was sympathetic to the 48-year-old author and chief executive officer of the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations in Saskatchewan. A U.S. federal public defender told the court that Walker is the victim of intimate partner abuse and as a result has been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. The judge told Walker that she hoped she would be able to see her son soon. She is facing charges in Canada that include public mischief and child abduction in contravention of a custody order. Well, Michelle Obamsawin is one step closer to becoming a Supreme Court justice. The Ontario judge fielded questions from parliamentarians in Ottawa this afternoon. She is the first Indigenous person to be nominated to Canada's top court. Fraser Needham has more. It was Obamsawin's first opportunity to address the public since her nomination to the Supreme Court of Canada last week. And she chose to speak her opening remarks in her traditional Abernaki language. Obonsawin shared her story and how her background and experience make her a good fit for the Supreme Court. And here's what she had to say about the implementation of Glad You principles in legal representation and sentencing. And that comes back to uh, education of, of judges where it's important for everyone in the legal community, not just judges, but lawyers also, to understand what it means to represent an Indigenous person and to ask the questions because unfortunately at times they'll take the client as they come and they don't ask more information other about the index offence and what happens. Obonsawin also spoke about the high percentage of Indigenous women in Canadian prisons in response to a question from Senator Kim Pate. I think it was Dr. Zinger's last report that showed that Indigenous women are close to 50% of the incarceration rates and we're less than 5% of the population. And uh, you and I have worked on this in the past when you were with the Elizabeth Fry Society and I was general counsel at the Royal where we would face these issues where um, we had uh, Indigenous people in the system. Um, I think that education is the key. And she had these words of advice for young Indigenous women thinking and pursuing a career in law and how far it might take them. But at the end of the day, if you work hard and your heart's in it, um, you could go and do what you want. And I'm hoping that young people, female, Indigenous w women also, um, will see that anything is possible if you, you set your mind to it. Fraser Needham, APTN National News, Ottawa. Two camps located on the grounds of the Manitoba Legislative Building are up against an eviction notice, but well past their original deadline to vacate. The occupants say that they're going to stay put. Here's Sav Jones with more. Manitoba's legislature is the site of two camps. Both were waiting with bated breath as the deadline for their eviction neared. The east side encampment was formed last May in response to the findings of unmarked graves at former residential school sites. They were set to be dismantled by 12 o'clock noon on August 23rd, but organizers decided to stay put for their cause, continuing their sacred fire until all residential school sites are searched and all unmarked graves are found. Let us be until the, all the sites are searched. Let us be here. Respect us being here. Respect our sacred fire going. The eviction order comes from the Manitoba government and is in line with the new legislation created earlier this year specifically regarding encampments on the legislative grounds. 
However, the occupants believe that their demonstration, its cultural purpose, and their need for peaceful healing should not be condemned if the province values reconciliation. Again, we're going to tell you where, we're going to tell you when, and we're going to tell you how to do your ceremonies, how to practice your culture. And if they don't like it happening right beside the building, then they say, well, we're evicting you. As the impending eviction loomed, the number of supporters for the camp grew. People waited peacefully, and an hour past the noon deadline for the camp to be dismantled, police were still not present. It became known that the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs and the leader of the opposition party, Wab Kanu, called for a delay in the eviction of the encampment, stating that the eviction of any peaceful camp does not support reconciliation between the province and First Nations. The Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs have, have asked the province to hold off on this camp. And uh, someone will be from, uh, come from the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs to come and talk to us. And in the meantime, they've asked them, the province, to hold off. They now have until at least this Friday, August 26th, to leave the premises before the eviction is enforced. A small but encouraging win for the determined demonstrators. Sav Jonza, APTN National News, Winnipeg. The problem of homelessness is across the country and the city of Vancouver says efforts are underway to find shelter for members of the unhoused community following attempts to clear the Hastings tent city. Officials say the decision to remove the tent city was due to fire safety and sanitary concerns. It's located in Vancouver's downtown east side. The tent community was the home of dozens of unhoused and vulnerable people. Activists were quick to criticize the clearing. Officials now say efforts are in place to provide housing to the displaced by the clearing. We continue to engage regularly with people experiencing homelessness uh, or at risk of homelessness along East Hastings, as well as the people staying in Crab Park and other locations around the city. Our outreach team works collaboratively with BC Housing's coordinated access and assessment team to identify candidates for suitable housing and shelter options and to support them in transitioning to those options. In addition, our outreach team works with individuals to provide rent supplements uh, where those would be constructive. On top of housing efforts, the city is providing food, additional public washrooms, and mental health resources. Well, a three-day hearing is underway in British Columbia's Supreme Court, where advocacy groups are for single mothers are there challenging the provincial legal aid system. The Single Mothers Alliance launched the case five years ago and are represented by West Coast LEAF an advocacy group that promotes equality at all levels of court. They say eligibility for legal aid does not meet the needs of low-income women, especially those within marginalized communities who are fleeing domestic violence. Single mothers can't earn more than around $29,000 in a two-person household if they are to qualify for legal aid. Raji Mangat with the West Coast Leaf says that means too many women are denied representation. Women are at great risk of further violence from an abusive ex when they make the crucial and life-changing decision to leave and seek safety. But too many are left without legal aid support at a time when the risk of violence and harassment is heightened, including when the court system itself is used to harass and intimidate. We welcome First Nations celebrated the transfer of territorial lands back to the nation. The agreement with the province of BC is now a milestone in a lengthy treaty negotiation process. The land is going to help the First Nation meet its economic goals. Lee Wilson explains. We welcome First Nation have been in treaty negotiations with the province of BC for 25 years. Earlier this month, the community celebrated as nearly 2,300 hectares of land located near Campbell River on Vancouver Island will be transferred back. We will come chief, Chris Roberts says, this incremental treaty agreement is an accomplishment. And this is the first time we've had a significant uh, agreement along the way of that treaty negotiation process. It's pretty significant to my nation as it's a, a sizable chunk of our land back into our, our title ownership and for us to be able to utilize as we see fit. According to the nation, the land was crown land used in BC timber sales. We would come First Nation, plan to continue operating it as forest land for the nation's benefit under their stewardship. Chief Chris Roberts shared, with such a lengthy treaty, band members were starting to lose faith in the process, but they see the land transfer as a major step forward in reconciliation with the province. 
He added the area is important for hunting and harvesting of plants and medicines, something they will consider as they manage the land. It's an opportunity to prove to ourselves as a people that we can walk the walk as well and manage the land base in a way that uh, generates economic benefit to us, but also doesn't compromise our long-term values of stewardship and sustainability. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Kitimat. We want to hear what you think about this or any of the stories that we bring you or the stories that we should be telling. Here's how you can reach us. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Leave a comment on our website, aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see all of our latest stories. Well, it's a story somewhere between a miracle and a mystery. An Anishinaabe man in Quebec went missing in the woods just outside his community, triggering a search effort by police and several neighboring communities. Last night, he was found alive after a month in the woods. And people want to know, how did he make it? Here's Lindsay Richardson. Percy Pukashish is 26. But in this first photo, taken after one month missing in the woods of western Quebec, he looks much older supported by a paramedic on one arm and provincial police on the other. According to the Sûreté du Québec, Pukachish was reported missing in late July and recovered relatively safe and sound on Tuesday night. A group of teens walking the riverfront in Pukachish's home community of Lac Simon heard screaming from across the water and called police, who located him 15 minutes later. Il y a eu beaucoup, beaucoup d'émotions hier. Les gens ont pleuré parce que c'est comme... Donc, ils ont pleuré de joie. Ils ont pleuré de joie, ils ont pleuré aussi de... Tu sais, c'est comme... Tu, tu le trouves, Percy, puis c'est pas le même, là, tu sais. C'est vraiment... Il y a beaucoup maigri. Lac Simon and at least two other communities located in the Lavarandre Wildlife Reserve quickly launched a joint search. While the Sûreté du Québec conducted air searches with helicopters and ground searches with dogs. But Jerome says, in the end, they canvassed the wrong side of the lake. C'est là la question. Aujourd'hui, à matin, plusieurs nous demandent, ça fait que t'es à l'autre bord du lac, t'y as-tu nagé, t'y as-tu... T'y allé en canot, t'y as-tu chaviré en canot, parce que on le sait pas. Pukashish is now in hospital and will be interviewed by the SQ. Despite the challenges of the last month, Jerome says it's a proud moment for Lac Simon because it's located near deep woods and Shinabe children here learn young how to forage and subsist, which may have helped Pukashish survive. Ce qu'on enseigne à nos enfants dans le primaire ou secondaire, ça, ça aide nos enfants, ça. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. Happy ending to that story. Well, we need to take a break. When we come back, we've got two Native Americans squaring off to fill a vacant Senate seat for Oklahoma. We're going to tell you who won. Stay with us. Welcome back. A filmmaker from the United States is reacting to the Academy Awards apology to Sachin Littlefeather. In 1973, Native rights activist Sachin Littlefeather made a short but poignant speech at the awards show wearing a buckskin dress and moccasins. She took to the stage in place of Best Actor winner Marlon Brando and explained that he could not accept the award because of the treatment of American Indians in the film industry. Littlefeather claims she was mocked and discriminated against for her speech. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences now says that it is sorry for the abuse and ridicule that she endured, and they will host an evening of healing and conversation with Littlefeather next month. Janelle Romero is an Indigenous actress, filmmaker, and humanitarian. I spoke with her earlier. Jonelle, thank you for joining us. You know, your thoughts about that, uh, the Academy's apology to Sachi and Littlefeather, uh, you know, 50 years in the making, I guess. Yeah, it is 50 years in the making. Um, I, uh, I think it's, it's way overdue. I, I, as a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, um, I'm thrilled that uh, it's happening now. And let's not, you know, 
you know, wait so long for, <laughs> for recognition. Yeah, I mean, apologies lose something the longer you wait, right? Um, what is the Red Nation International Film Festival and awards, and how did it lead to this apology? If you could just share a little bit of that with our audience. Sure. Um, Red Nation uh, International Film Festival is the largest native film festival uh, in the country here in the U.S. and probably the world, but I can definitely state in the U.S. And um, we are in our 27th year, and so uh, Sashin uh, breaking the silence, uh, Doc Short was made, uh, and so with filmmakers from um, Wumble uh, Productions, and so they submitted it, and it won at our festival in 2019, and uh, pre-pandemic pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. And we also are the only festival in the world that has uh, the Brando Award. We created the Brando Award because we wanted to recognize Marlon Brando for all of his support throughout the many, many years mm -hmm. um, when he was with us, you know, uh, with our uh, Native and Indigenous peoples all over the world. Uh, so we went to his uh, kids, Amico Brando and Rebecca Brando, and, and have a blessing and endorsement. So we honored, this is the nice. only award that Sashin has been given in her whole, since 1973. So in 2019, it was her 73rd birthday. So oh, wow. it was very auspicious that that happened in 1973 and it's her 73rd birthday. And we honored her with the Brando Award. It's the only award that she's been that she's uh, been recognized with. I love that. Um, I'm curious, what's your experience been as an Indigenous person who's a member of the Academy, if you could share that with us? Well, we have, we have a long way to go. I think this apology is a step forward, but in regards to inclusion and transparency and mm. accountability, uh, we have a a long way to go. Um, there's um, branches within the academy, uh, you know, like the actress branch and director's branch and, and producer's branch. And they, um, in 2016, I was the first Native uh, woman to be invited into the academy, which is, you know, is a little girl's dream since right. I was raised in this industry, 45 years in this industry, right? So, um, but I was put in the associate branch and that branch as of today doesn't even exist. So I'm in limbo right now. So we've had, um, you know, other Academy members like Edward James Omos and uh, Alma Martinez and Ed Bagley Jr. write letters to the Academy since 2016 to place me in either the actor's branch or the producer's branch. And so that's still up in the air mm. because see the associated branch, you, you really don't have a voice. I think that's why they discontinued it this year mm. um, uh, because we don't get to vote and, and we, don't, we don't get to be on any committees per se uh, that where we can make a difference. And being, you know, having our Red Nation Celebration Institute, which is the longest running native indigenous media arts cultural nonprofit enterprise in the entertainment industry mm -hmm. right um, you would with my resume and with our institute and with the largest native film festival in the country and our own television network you would think I would be in one of these branches right. by now yeah yeah so that's what I mean when and I know I'm not the only one I'm just mm -hmm. I'm just one speaking up you know that so we, we do have a long way to go, and we we really are excited that um, that this is that this is happening for Sashin while she's still with us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Jonelle, thank you for taking the time to share with us, and uh, we look forward to seeing where you land in in that academy. Get get that voice going. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor, mm. privilege. There are some questions about Little Feather's story, but we will continue to follow as that develops. Well, a retiring Oklahoma senator set the stage for a showdown between two Native American candidates vying to replace him. U.S. Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen of the Cherokee Nation defeated former Speaker of the Oklahoma House T.W. Shannon, who is a member of the Chickasaw Nation, and he's also part African American. 
They wanted to take over a U.S. Senate seat left empty by a retirement. There's four years left on the term before the next election. Indian Country Today reports that Mullen, a former mixed martial arts fighter, is favored to win when they go to the polls in the next general election, as Oklahoma hasn't elected a Democrat to the U.S. Senate in more than 30 years. Nearly 10 percent of the state identifies as African or Amer American Indian. It's time for another break, but coming up, we will take you to New Zealand for a new agreement with Canada. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Desk in Slate Falls First Nation shared by Robin Fay. What a great shot there. You can send us your pictures to share at aptn.ca. Make sure you send a location and a description of what we'd be seeing. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Cloud on the east coast, 26 for Charlotte, 10, 27 with a chance of showers for Halifax. Kujuak showers in 14 degrees, sunshine for you in Nain, 17. Settles, 22 in sunny skies, St. Jovite, 24 and sunshine. 23 and sunny for Ottawa. Sault Ste. Marie showers 19 degrees expected there. Sunny and 21 for Sioux. Look at Capus Casing showers in 15. 17 in showers for Thompson, Pocketawaga and Mixed Sun and Cloud, 22 degrees. Sunshine and 24 for Winnipeg, 29 and sunny for Dauphin. Lots of sun in southern Saskatchewan, 28 for North Battleford and Saskatoon. 29 and sunshine for Buffalo Narrows, 28 and sunny for La Range and Meadow Lake. Hot and sunny in northern Alberta, 30 for Fort Chip, 31 for Peace River. 19 and chance of showers for Lethbridge, 23 and sunny for Calgary. 20, or 33 and sunshine for Kamloops, 26 and sunny for Vancouver. Showers for Prince Rupert, 17 degrees, 30 and sunny in Fort Nelson. Beaver Creek, 17 and sunny. Showers expected for Whitehorse, 17 degrees there. Wati, 27 and sunshine. Norman Wells, 19 and showers. Fort McPherson, 20 and sunny. Uh, Politech makes a sun and cloud, 18 degrees expected there. Chesterfield makes a sun and cloud, 10 degrees. RV at sunshine, 18 degrees. Clyde River, 3 with maybe some flurries. Arctic Bay, 7 and sunshine. Canada and Hauteroa, also known as the country uh, of New Zealand, have signed a historic agreement today aimed at strengthening their unique indigenous cultures. That, of course, is the haka, the traditional dance of the Maori. The two countries signed a collaboration agreement that advanced a shared commitment to indigenous culture. It will focus on promoting Indigenous rights, supporting culture and spiritual development, as well as implementing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. The move comes as New Zealand celebrated its first Indigenous public holiday this year. We are all out of time for your midweek news. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Thanks so much for tuning in. Dennis Ward is going to be back here in the chair tomorrow with more Indigenous news for you. Until then, have a great night.